All right, let's get going. Um, my name is Rick Weisbord. I am on the faculty of the Harvard Graduate School of Education, the Kennedy School of Government. I'm the faculty director of the Making Caring Common Project, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to Education Now. Um, all of these episodes are recorded and available on your YouTube channel and Facebook page. You can also visit hgse.me backslash ednow for recordings and information about future episodes. Um, I am really thrilled that we are taking up this topic of mental health in rural areas and more generally um, the mental health challenges of our teens and our young people. We have some wonderful guests today. I also just want to give a, a shout out to all the mental health providers and all the teachers out there. I know this is a tough and stressful time to be doing the work you're doing and we're all cheering for you. Um, we want to just jump right into this. So let me welcome, we don't have a lot of time. So let me just introduce you briefly to our guest. Blake Berryhill is an assistant professor in the Department of Human Development and Family Studies at the University of Alabama. LaVon, LaVon Fox is vice president of academic affairs at Turtle Mountain Community College. It's a private tribal land grant college in North Dakota. And Robert Rourke is a former, former principal of Leslie County High School in Kentucky. He's currently a project director with Partners for Rural Impact. Welcome LaVon, Blake, and Robert. It is a pleasure to have you here today. So uh, Robert, why don't, why, don't we start with, why don't we start with you? And um, where I'd love to get started is, is if you can help us understand what are the specific mental health challenges of the young people in Leslie County that you are working with. Um, how do you think we got to where we are today, too? I know the pandemic has exacerbated these mental health challenges for kids around the country, but these trends began before the pandemic. So I'd love to hear your thoughts both about the history and um, where you think we are now. Well, Leslie, Leslie County, like a lot of rural areas, we have a lot of uh, high, high unemployment rate. Uh, a lot of addiction issues, a lot of grandparents raising uh, grandchildren. Um, and, and you're right. Uh, as a principal, I noticed in a, as a high school counselor that we, we were seeing a lot of mental health issues 2009, 2010, 2011. But really, the pandemic really just, to me, it, it just, it really brought it to the forefront. Right, right. Yeah. Um, as a, I was principal in, right before, when the pandemic hit, and myself and my guidance counselor, we called every kid in our high school because we had went to virtual settings. And we were, what we were finding out talking to those kids were not good. You know, they were sleeping late. They just uh, seemed depressed. A lot of them, you know, hadn't seen their friends. They weren't around their peers. So we knew that there was a lot of, going to be a lot of issues. It was hard for kids that needed to see, that seek treatment. They couldn't because of the pandemic. So when I became the project director of a full service community grant in August of uh, 2020, one of the first things I did when we were, were back to school was um, we uh, had our kids uh, do a mental health screener and the findings were appalling. Uh, you know, depression, the number of kids that were uh, anxiety, the number of kids that were really needing help had doubled. Um, you know, and I, I think about when I was in high school, if I would have lost my before and after the pandemic. Then the yes. Pandemic. And well, I think the pandemic really yeah. it just added to that so much. They felt hopeless. I think a lot of hopelessness. So we 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 push. I have a coordinator at each of my schools in the district, and we really want we really met with our teachers and our principals uh, to kind of find those kids that needed intervention. You've got to know your kids in rural settings. And that's something we, we really wanted to reach out to. Um, we were still having issues with getting kids help. Uh, so uh, we were really, about our, really worried about our kids on the weekends and uh, during the summer and at night uh, when they weren't around their peers and around their friends and so forth. So one of the, one of the things that we created at, uh, at Leslie was some mental health kits. So we uh, put fidget toys, art supplies. Uh, we talked to a lot of mental health providers on what we could add to these kits that would 
help kids with anxiety and depression at home. Uh, the older kids uh, had uh, journals, so they could journal about their feelings in it. Uh, art supplies was a big thing. Uh, and, it, and it seemed to really help. The kids really liked them. Uh, their mental health providers that we uh, uh, got them to see really thought there was a, a change and helped them. Uh, I often tell a story. I had one, one child that was about 10 and he ran away from home. He didn't get far, but he ran away from home. And when I talked to the officers that found him, one of the few things he had with him in his possession was his mental health kit. So he thought enough about that to take it with him. Um, so uh, we're just trying to make sure that no kids slip through the cracks. And in rural areas, it's tough. You know, it, it's hard to get to um, uh, organizations that can provide treatment for these uh, children. Uh, we don't have the capacity that a lot of say you do in, in, in metro areas. Uh, so it's, it's, it's been tough, yeah. but uh, it's, it's, it's a battle we're fighting and we're going to continue to fight. Thank you so much. Um, Levon, let me, let me turn to you and I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on, um, on the, on the same question, essentially your mental health statistics show that up to 70% of native Americans will suffer some sort of mental health disorder. Um, it would be great if you could help us understand the story, why you think these rates are so high. And um, I know you do work on identity too, and I, we'd love to hear your thoughts about how identity is related to this. Um, I'd like to begin by just thanking you for this opportunity. And a lot of commonalities um, between what we experience here and what Robert just identified is present. You look at where um, Native American reservations are and they're very rural. Um, out in the middle of nowhere. So we're looking at an access issue for one thing and then lack of um, funding. You know, there's always the misunderstanding that Native Americans get free education and healthcare. But if you look at, um, this is in 2017, 2018 was similar. We received, I think it was about uh, $2,000 per person, but uh, the um, federal prisoner, they got close to 6,000, over 6,000 per person within the federal prison. So um, our healthcare actually then was running about 50, you know, 51, 49 around there percent underfunded, let alone, so it becomes like a triage, let alone anything that would have happen to um, do with mental health. Our issues actually go farther, even, even farther back than that. When we look at, um, well, the term historical trauma is trauma that we're still experiencing today. When we look at generational, transgenerational trauma, and a lot of it, of course, um, can stem from the fact of the loss of land, you know, um, if you look at our history. But the, I, I would guess, I would say the biggest uh, probably proponent of that is um, the cultural genocide that occurred with the boarding school era. So um, it was much cheaper than it was determined by um, the federal government and some of the um, Christian churches that it's much cheaper to place indigenous children into boarding schools and then erase the culture. So they were not allowed to speak the language, dress, et cetera. Um, and so then when they went home, they no, no longer could kind of connect with, you know, the, their families and their communities. And then the communities were upset because they knew then that the culture was kind of being erased. Um, and, and that's exactly what happened. Bring it into the sixties and we got the 60 scoops then where um, Native children were being taken out of their homes again, but it was by the welfare system. Um, then you go into the next, which would be the 70s, and then the next step in that was they were removed and put into um, adoption agencies. All along, it was not by choice. Um, most of it was just interjection of the federal government and then related um, entities. So based on that, then what you have throughout those generations is a loss of cultural identity. And First Nations people in Canada have done a lot of work on looking at, they have the same issue with us as us, you know, looking at this high suicide rates between 15 and 24 and what's happening here. And they've actually made more headway than we have. What they found is if you bring in more of the cultural pieces, again, the language and um, whatever um, cultural pieces are missing or understanding the cultural background of your own community, they're seeing a decrease in the suicide rates, increase in mental health and wellness, increase in um, engagement in schools. 
And I can give you just an example even from myself. So when I was young, um, we used to play Cowboys and Indians. No one wanted to be the Indians because they were stupid. They dressed stupid. They couldn't talk English. They didn't look how we were. So here you have a whole group of children who don't even see themselves reflected in that and won't even acknowledge that that's part of their own culture. That piece has not always changed. It took me into my late 30s to finally come to some kind of, um, I guess, acknowledgement of that part of me and then trying to rebuild that back. You know, so I know for myself how it affected my confidence and self-esteem. So um, that that's a huge part of identity. And I mean, that's one of the things that if you can, if you can bring back that cultural piece, that's a huge protective factor. Could you speak to, I mean, this is, this is super helpful and interesting, but you have thoughts about the effect of the, the pandemic in the last couple of years and the ways in which it's exacerbated or changed or the situation? Um, well, one of the issues already was there's not always a trust in education or in healthcare anyway. So if you look at some of the things that have happened historically, like the boarding schools and education there, education was not designed to help us succeed. It was designed to remove culture. Mm -hmm. And so then you look at healthcare where there was um, forced sterilization of indigenous women in the 70s. I mean, a lot of these things happened within healthcare. So the um, going into the pandemic then, I think you notice more, like I did with my kids when they were um, going on classes online virtually, there was not as much engagement between the schools and the parents because that had kind of just never been there in the first place. You know, so our graduation rates are also not high. And I think that's also connected back and research has shown connected back to um, the boarding school era. So we already had these problems in place. And I think what happened uh, pandemic and post pandemic is it really highlighted those, those issues. Um, and how do we actually kind of remove those silos of education and community and put everything, you know, back to where working together and not so separated? I don't know if that answers what you were asking. No, it does. It does. Thank you very much. Um, really appreciate it. Um, Blake, I know that you have done work on, on depression in adolescents and young adults. And I mean, if you have some quick thoughts, unfortunately, we don't have very much time, but about how we got here, I'd love to hear those too. But I'd also love to hear your thoughts because I know it's an area of your work on access to treatment, um, uh, the availability of treatment, your thoughts about teletherapy or other forms of treatment that might be useful in rural areas where treatment options are scarce. Yes, yes thank you. Well, um, well, in Alabama, we historically rank in we're 48th, 49th, or 50th in the number of mental health providers, um, you know, uh, per, you know, per geographic location. And so uh, there's not enough access to services to go around. That combined with the increasing rates of anxiety and depression among adolescents, um, you know, something needs to happen to get these teens the help that they need. Um, the rates of anxiety and depression were even on the rise before the pandemic, and then the pandemic exacerbated things. I think we have some experience with that. Uh, but in Alabama, you know, most of our state is rural, and most of our state has a lot of the challenges that most rural areas have. A uh, few mental health providers serving rural communities, um, uh, residents not having uh, they have transportation needs, uh, not being able to travel to uh, services, and then the lack of public transportation, and also the costs associated uh, with getting the care that they need, because historically rural areas uh, have you know, lower income than more of the metro areas. Um, and so one thing that did happen during the pandemic to increase access is to with was the rise of telehealth services or teletherapy services or online therapy, uh, whatever name you want to include there. And I, I think that that really helped increase access, uh, but rural areas still have the challenges of having the proper uh, techno technology infrastructure to provide uh, the proper broadband to conduct those teletherapy services. And so some insurance companies have un under teletherapy or telehealth, they include you know, phone calls or texting therapy. And so those could be some of the options. Uh, here in Alabama, some of our community mental health 
um, uh, centers. Um, they have, you know, gone into schools. Uh, they've really tried to help meet the need through some of these teletherapy outlets. Great, thank you. Um, let me just let me just shift gears here, and, and this is a this is a question for all of you, any, and you know any of you who want to take this up. Um, question is, what are we going to what are we going to do about this? And um, I don't know if you have thoughts about um, alternative forms of treatment, given the challenges of treatment, but also about primary and secondary prevention. Um, and you know, Robert, you mentioned a toolkit as one possible response, but I. Blake and Levan, I'd love to I'd love to hear your thoughts about this as well. And I guess I will just say quickly that, you know, I, I absolutely think we need to, we need to create more mental health providers in rural areas. But but in general, in this country, I don't think we're going to medicate or therapize our way out of this problem. I I just really think we need to do a lot more to cultivate resilience and create supportive networks for kids. But I would I would love to hear your thoughts about this. Oh, I, can, I can begin. So one of the things I began working with was the um, Mental Health um, Technology Transfer Center um, supported by SAMHSA. And um, my colleague and I provide training to schools that have a high number of Indigenous um, students. And so we train the teachers. We take so many each semester, these schools, and we train them then on kind of the historical trauma or the impact in the classroom. And what you could see in the classroom and what might be underlying that. And then we bring them through a series of um, interventions that they could use that are cultural and language based. And so then we, we've worked with um, tribes in Montana, uh, Arizona, Utah, et cetera. But that's, that's the big thing we've been working on is just what are some appropriate cultural interventions? And how can we kind of share those out more so more people can access them and use them in the schools or in, or in a mental health setting? Um, Great, thank you. Robert or Blake, your thoughts about this you want to share? I'll say this, I think in rural areas and culture, especially in Appalachia, where uh, Leslie is located, you kind of have a stigma against, you're, you're taught early on, um, and I was as a child, you don't, you, um, you be tough, you don't reach, there, there's kind of a stigma about reaching out for help. And I think that's a lot of rural areas. Uh, and, uh, and I understand that, that we're, we need resilience, but we also need to have a culture where we don't look down on kids that, that will actually say, hey, I need help. Yeah. Or uh, I've got a friend that needs help. And so we're trying to do that. Uh, we're trying to you know, talk to our kids and say, hey, if you've got a friend that's posting something online uh, that's upsetting to you, we need to know about it. You know, if you see it, we need to know about it. Um, we talked about how things have changed. The case of self-harm, Since I've been in education 32 years, and it's amazing the growth of that, unfortunately. Um, so, uh, you know, you, you want to educate your kids, and you, ha you have to tell them that it's okay to, to get help. And uh, I think that's kind of been a problem, especially in, in, in rural areas. Yeah, I agree with everything that Robert said, and I would add to that of, you know, what does it mean to, you know, train our teachers and administrators to, you know, help identify and be part of the conversation? And I think that's where it starts to, to have conversations. I think, you know, teachers can be trained in mental health first aid, which is uh, just a program. It's an online program to help, you know, teachers, administrators, uh, to really help identify and respond if they see, see a student in need. Uh, and so I, I definitely think, you know, having training, you know, from the top down to really address this and uh, really support the students. I, I think I it's still, key, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, go ahead, Lon. I just want to add a key piece to that too that's, that's I think missing often is the parents. So the school needs to connect with those parents because if they send them home, there's no continuation of what you just did within the school. That's right. You know, so I, I always think that's kind of the missing link that we have. And that's what I mean by bringing education back in the community, you know, so it isn't so siloed into just a, a school building. Yeah, Robert, it like you want to jump in here too. Well, it's just, I, I think that, uh, you know, 
Blake said it, you know, you've got to have teachers and principals, but I'll tell you something that surprised me. And, and I've been, a, we've talked about sports before uh, I've, I've coached and stuff and I've had coaches reach out to me and say, Hey, I've got kids that, you know, depression, you know, football coaches, and you don't, you, you wouldn't think that as much from, you know, 17, 18 year old kids that are just these big athletes, but they're struggling too. You know, it's uh, and so I've got, I've had coaches reach out to me and say, Hey, you know, what can we do to get this kid some help? Uh, they, you know, it looks like they have the world in front of them, but they're struggling. And uh, I, I think that's been surprising. That's something in the past that hasn't happened, but I've had a lot of coaches reach out and say, Hey, we've got kids that, you know, that need help. Great. Thank you. We have, um, let me see if I can sneak in just one other quick question that I just want to turn to the questions that are in the chat. Um, there's a lot of debate these days about the role of social media in this and the role of technology in this. And I know there are issues in rural areas with access to technology, but I wonder whether you think, what kind of role you think social media is playing, either, either positive or negative. Um, you know, I know a lot of kids find important connections on social media. Um, they have, they're influenced by positive influencers on social media. Anyway, I, I, anyone's up for sharing your thoughts about this? Well, I actually don't let my kids have any social media. Um, maybe what they get is at school. Um, largely because I, I adopted my two younger ones I actually adopted um, and they have special mental health needs. So my clinical background is actually an occupational therapist and I worked in mental health for about uh, 12 years. So I already knew the impact of social media. Um, and so, so I didn't want them to be exposed to that. But the other part of just being indigenous is the media does not portray, and I would say anyone, even rural, rural people, indigenous people, it doesn't portray um, them often positive and even mental health in general, you know? So I think that's the challenge with social media. Telehealth, that's the only way my um, son can access uh, his psychiatrist who is in New Jersey and we're in North Dakota. You know, so when you look at the benefits of technology and then the pros and cons, you know, of, of what's happening with them, there, there's both. Great, thank you. I think we're gonna have to spend some money on infrastructure. Um, rural areas need broadband for telehealth. I, I'm, uh, I think that's, the, that that can do a lot uh, to help, but I'll say this: uh, in 32 years of education, you know, and, and the internet coming coming around, it's um, it's caused a lot of issues. Kids are, are bullied online. Uh, sometimes I'm surprised that parents, as a as a former principal, they didn't really understand who their kids were talking to, and uh, you've got to know you know, who these kids are, what's, what's being said to them online. I, I, I really feel that as a parent and as an educator. Uh, I think a lot of your self-harm, I think a lot of that comes from bullying on the internet. Um, and it can be dangerous, can lead to a lot of, uh, a lot of dark places. Uh, Great, thank you. Uh I'm sorry, Blake, did you want to jump in here? Uh, the only thing I'll add is, the, you know, some, uh, you know, I think some people have the assumption that technology um, actually increases connectivity and, incre and decreases loneliness. But research shows that the opposite is true, that the more technology and the more somebody is online, it actually increases loneliness. And so I think having, you know, proper messages based in facts and communicating those uh, I think should be part of the conversation. You know, you know, Blake, I think the the research that I'm more familiar with is saying that, in a sense, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer on social media, that if you have social connections, being on social, you already have strong social connections, being on social media can be supportive, enriching, but if you don't, you're significantly likely to feel more lonely the more time you spend on social media. Yeah. Um, so why don't we turn to a few questions from the audience. There's some wonderful questions. Um, Jennifer Chase asks, can you discuss the larger community systems needed to be engaged to support rural families in ways that could head off the trauma that contributes to the need for these services? 
well, I think the schools have to be more open to their parents. We've got to have more uh, after hours uh, uh, meetings with parents, uh, not just meetings, but art shows, science shows, fairs, invite those families in and make them welcome at your school. And I think we've tried to do that. I think one of the essential things for, for schools, and as I think I can speak to as a former principal, we have to get kids involved. And some t- and 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 I hate to say this, but some schools, you know, concentrate too much on sports. They don't concentrate on other like the arts, music, other things that kids are are into. And those kids are kind of left out, and they're not a, and they don't feel a part of something. So I think that when you when you offer as much as you can to these kids, uh, they feel a part of something, and there's it takes kind of the place of the loneliness. They feel a part of it. Uh, we started a esports program at the school I was at, and we had a lot of kids that were just in my, I hate to say this term, but loners, but they loved it. And it's really grown. So you've got to know your kids. I, I think about 70% of our kids are, are involved in some extracurricular activity besides school at the school. And I think that's, um, I think that's essential. Great, LeVon or Blake, you want to, you, you have thoughts here? I just think, um, agreeing with what Robert said, the other thing is um, I've done some work too with the police department, helping um, the police department understand, you know, some of these needs too. So there's that quick judgment toward a, a child or someone who might be doing something um, they deem as inappropriate by getting the background on that. The other thing I really noticed is coming back to work here and taking this position is that so we're talking about our youth right now and, and the challenges they're dealing with. But I also realize when I'm dealing with the faculty here who um, grew up here, I'm also dealing with their trauma that hasn't been dealt with because we didn't have services here for them. You know, so you're dealing with different levels of trauma, which is why I think it's so important to take a whole community kind of approach. Um, so you're not, not, no one falls in between the cracks and we can start getting everybody in the same conversation. And, and parents' trauma, right? I mean, this is to Rob, to Robert's point. Mm-hmm. Uh, so let me let let's start. Let's we have to wrap up in just a few minutes, but be nice. You know, one of the things we always try and wrap up it with is is a hopeful note. And I wonder um, if there there are strategies or tactics or things that you're seeing, whether it's in your area or other areas, that are giving you hope um, in addressing some of these challenges. And I wonder if we could go around and I could hear from each of you about where you're feeling hopeful in, in this work. I know, I know for me, I'm hopeful that, uh, you know, by and large, individuals in these rural communities really care about one another. Uh, the teachers, administrators really care about the students and families and want want what's best for them and provide them the services they need. You know, and I and I think that um, as long as that relationship is there, I think a lot of good can be done. Um, conversations, uh, helping students think about things a different way, connecting families to resources. And I think that time and attention is, is really important uh, in, in, you know, in helping this. Thank you. LeVon, you want to jump, jump in? I think just building off what Blake said, I think where the schools become, the, they could become a main resource. Um, I think that's essential because in most communities, it's either the school that, or the church, you know, so. So, I mean, that's usually what is the, um, the stable things there. The other thing that I really found a lot of research and in the work I've been doing that um, has connected with people, it's called the circle of courage. And there's four areas in there. There's the belonging, the mastery, the independence, and the generosity. And I was thinking about what Robert said earlier, the belonging is the first one. If you feel a sense of belonging, and everybody wants to belong. So you'll either belong to something that's not good for you, or you'll belong to something that is good. If there's more options for what is good, you know, then that that's what we want to be able to provide, right? But that belonging and that attachment is so essential as a first step. So I really like when you brought that up, Robert. Um, I'll say this. I think Blake and LeBlanc both hit it. You, we, in rural areas, I'm really proud of how teachers, principals, counselors, families 
how much they they love their kids, which I mean, they, they do. And they do a great job with it. And I, I think they want what's best for them. And I know the challenges. I grew up there. I know the challenges they face, uh, kids face every day. But we've had a lot of success and a lot of I've had kids that went to Harvard and Brown. And, you know, uh, when you're from uh, a small town in eastern Kentucky, uh, you know, it's kind of heard of those kids are, you know, they're not supposed to go to Harvard. Uh, and they're kind of taught that way culturally, you know, we're kind of stereotyped too. uh, Appalachian people are. So for kids to be successful, I think the, that's the great outcome. And I, I, you know, I think that we're producing kids that, uh, that are successful. We just got to make sure all of them are. Great. Well, I, I can't thank you all enough. This has been, um, super interesting and helpful. I really appreciate, really appreciate your taking the time. And I, um, and very grateful for the work you do. So, so thank you, thank you all very much. I, th- I think we're going to have time for a few takeaways, a few key takeaways for our audiences, for our audience. So, one of the one of the biggest things we look at adolescents, and it talks about number one, is looking at how we can um, first remove um, stigma. And I think that goes with what um, Robert was talking about too, but also access, and that's not just access to mental health services, but access to adults who care access to, you know, to a community that, that cares. So looking at that, the second one, I think it's more focused on is if we can bring that cultural piece and that language piece, that's a huge protective factor for indigenous. But I also think it could be when I listen to Robert's background too, um, talking about his students, but a cultural identity that they're proud of where they came from, how they were raised, that that's so essential, I think for, you know, for um, anybody um, to just feel proud of where you come from. And then the third is just to really get trained and identify um, those red flags. Um, And a lot of it is behaviors that we would label as being a bad child. And there's no such thing as a bad child, but there's always an underlying factor with those. And I don't know if I covered everybody else's versus just mine. And I apologize if I did. Uh, um, Blake or Robert, thank you, LeVon. Blake or Robert, anything you want to add? Yeah, I'll just add a quick uh, resource, and I think it, it, it's on uh, the main sheet, but it's the National Center for Rural School Mental Health. And on the website, there's an intervention hub that has uh, tier one, tier two, and tier three interventions um, and, and things you, you, you can do with, with everybody's students. So I just want to mention that. Thanks so much. All right. Um, Well, once again, thank you all. Um, Be be well. Thanks to our audience. And let's all keep, I know you will, but let's all keep plugging away at these issues. They're so important. Take care of yourselves. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.